Good morning. Good morning. We have man voice today. Well, you have. I do all the time. You know, but you have deeper man voice. You are a baritone today. Good morning, everyone. We're talking about eye candy today. So we're wishing you a happy Friday. And this is a topic that doesn't get enough attention in the industry. It's kind of a uh, one that's put back on the back burner. And it's, it's a, a message that we're going to get to it when we can. So excited to begin. I know. You love this topic. You don't even think about this topic. No, I don't. You know. it's, it's really your special. Well, and, and it's it's one that he knows it when he sees it. Like, he'll nudge me and, wow, this business looks good. Or look at how it's operating. Or look at how they went to all these details. But he doesn't notice it. And, and he doesn't notice it when it's bad. You know, he only notice it when it really is good. Mm -hmm. So we'll have his his input on that as we go. So here we go. Eye candy, let's talk about the definition because I, I looked it up and I thought, you know, what's the world's definition of it? And it wasn't in the, the Webster, it was in the new Webster hip definition. And something purely aesthetically pleasing that is pleasing to the senses can be a person, a film, a sunset, a flower, or anything you can see and witness that creates that eye candy for you. And, you know, it's, it's something that... Um, businesses either have or don't. You're not half half okay at this. There are restaurants, um, we go to one, and I, and I don't want to bash them, but um, it's a place my mother enjoys. And she's 85, and we walk in and I think, gosh, the tables are in the wrong place, the front desk is in the wrong place, their service areas are in the wrong place, the way they bust the tables is so loud. It scares you when they bust. They have absolutely no eye candy. And, and definitely, I don't know how much longer they're going to be there because they don't. And eye candy is not just about having taste level. It's about having everything in place so it's pleasing to the senses. I really want to make sure that we know the difference on this. Yeah, sanitation plays a big part in this and, and having great taste but that the customer enjoys the experience from the time they walk in to they leave, it's aesthetically pleasing. And, and you'll understand what I mean by that as we go along. So when your guests are drawn aesthetically, and I, and I saw this in a, in a book and I, and I thought, wow, power attraction. And you know, we talk about power scheduling or power booking or um, hiring people that have the it factor. Power attraction is something that takes a lot of work. Uh, they have to experience your offerings when they walk in. I'll tell you the best company that does this hands down is Nordstrom. As soon as I walk in the door, I'm, I almost don't know where to run first. It's so inviting. The scent is inviting. The way they display is inviting. Their purposeful positioning of their products, um, whether it's, it's going even into their, their shoe department is different than most. And when there's a power attraction, you have to experience their offerings. You have to. You have to walk it. You have to feel it. You are afraid you're missing out if you don't. And the biggest thing is, is if you had to say, does Nordstrom describe what they do visually? Absolutely. You absolutely know what they're about. And they have a lot of the same thing other anchors have. Uh, Neiman Marcus carries a lot of the same merchandise, Saks Avenue, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue carries it. But Nordstrom really appeals to the senses, whether it's their music, their people, the way they lean in, their energy, their lighting, um, their playfulness. There's something really magical about them. And even riding the escalator. When you are in a Nordstrom, you're looking both ways to see what you're attracted to. When I go up the escalator at Neiman's, it's flat, and I just ride the escalator. I'm not Sometimes observing. it'll be a blank wall on either side. Yeah. So you're going up. Right. So this is something. So if you can't describe what you do visually, you're missing a key component to create power attraction. Well, I think the other the other part of this is is that eye candy has to be obvious everywhere where you are, everywhere where your brand shows up. I think about um, two recent things, and you know my, a lot of my examples are Starbucks because I admire them so much. 
but but I think if you look at the two last major pushes that they have had, uh, one was their blonde, their blonde espresso, and it was the background on the app. The first thing that greeted you on the app, the first big panel that greeted you on the drive-through. It had a window cling that drew attention to it. When you stepped up, when you stepped up to the counter, you had. Uh, it was obvious. Everybody was obvious. That obviously behind and aesthetically behind. Blonde. Well, now what is it? Now it's their summer drinks. And and everywhere you go, you see the new triple mocha and the new caramel experience of a frappuccino that they've had forever. But because it's summer and because they're drawing attention to their summer drinks, that now is on the app. It's on the, the, the billboard by the drive through and it's everywhere. Beautiful hands-on pictures of it uh, inside behind the behind the order counter. And and, and again, it's how do we do that? See, that's that's some of the it's intentional that oh, they yeah. do it. And I think the first thing that someone might be listening to and creating a uh, a pushback would be we don't have their budget, right? We don't have their budget to do that. But you do have the ideas to do that. And it, it, we're not talking about expense here. We're talking about obvious, what you're trying to create in the business. And for example, sometimes you can walk in your business and take home is to the back of the customer or any visuals. We'll see the floor technically, but we don't see everything else that you do. Sometimes the color bar isn't obvious. That's why dispensaries were, don't create power attraction because they're not obvious for the guests. And when a color bar came out, we were able to celebrate color in a better and more magical way. They know what you know, and they know that you know what you're doing and what you're all about right when they step in the door. And we're missing that in a lot of salons that, that we walk into. And it's, it's something that is going to take some probably some mind shifts or maybe even some expense. I'm not talking about money here. I'm talking about you being able to critique and say, are we so comfortable here that we can find it? No, the guest, this isn't hide and seek. The guests want to know what you're all about visually. And it's, it's an unspoken that is so obvious. Nordstrom doesn't have to walk in and, and, and say, right this way, let me escort you. No, no, I'm good. Let me just think. Let me just walk this business and, and enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about power attraction, this is big. It, 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 these are the kind of the points that go with it. You must be crystal clear who you are, what you are. Um, it, it's clear that, that you want to be best in class. It's clear that uh, you are a salon, but it, it has to be clear what services you offer. What are your categories? of um, services that you do. Uh, it, you need to be very confident in your, in your power attraction uh, displays, meaning our areas look purposeful. We have to be current. I'm, I'm gonna say this later on in the presentation too, but how can you say you do current hair when your business doesn't look current, right? Mm -hmm. That's very, very difficult. The guest needs to know that, that you're on trend. You have to be unique. In what you do and how you do it, I think I think Nordstrom was the first person that exposed the uh, cosmetics area. They were right. So the cosmetic area used to all be behind shelving, and the service providers worked behind. And you knew you were walking up to the Chanel counter. I'm going to speak to a service provider. There always is going to be a divide between us. And it created their displays and their conversation and their, their uh, way they talked about their product. But when they decide to open it up to allow it to be interactive for the guests, the guests can test, test or touch anything they want in the cosmetic area on their own or with assistance. It was, um, it was a unique approach, but I, I loved it. A memorable experience is going to create that power attraction and you are the person that gets on the list. And what I mean by that is everyone's trying to make the list. PSC's trying to make the list by being your distributor of choice. We want to be in that. We're trying to make the list always to make your list of being on, in your mind, 
right? Um, cosmetics are trying to make the list. Brands are trying to make the list. Uh, vacation spots are trying to make the list. Everyone's trying to make the list. And you want to be the one that kind of sets the standard for other people. People want to catch you and then you push your business forward again. But if you're trying to, if, if being in the number 10 or number 15 or the 20th position is okay for you, power attraction is going to be difficult for you to create. Well, I think we know when it happens. I, I think there's, we have been watching these last several episodes of The Voice. And I think that when this power attraction, this thing happens, and it can happen in a moment, that's, that's what I want to impress on everybody from, from where I sit, is that, that power attraction, that clear, that confident, current, unique is, re, is very important, memorable. That can be with the first note. Oh, you know that can go from silent, dark stage to the light coming up, the first contact that you have visually with, a, with that person, and their first note, you know. And, and, and it's really remarkable. And that happens in a, in a business too. Mm -hmm. There's businesses you walk in and, and you just know. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And it's a, it's a combination of everything. And, and I know we're gonna talk about the individual things as they break down, but it is a combination of everything. And it's, it's very intentional. That's, that's one of the things, it's, it's intended by that business to be that way. And if we're just leaving that as something that's on the back burner, I know that everyone comments when they walk into PSC, our, our home office here, whether it be for education or a meeting, they always comment on the scent of PSC. That's intentional. That's not left to chance. Well, they talk, they, they talk about the sanitation, they talk about the visual design, all, all intentional. I had someone here uh, over the weekend uh, for the Sharon Blaine boot camp, and I hadn't seen this gentleman in, in probably 25 years, at least. And he came up to me and said, how long ago did you move in here? Did you just move in? And I said, no, actually, it's five six or six years, years ago. Six years. And he said, wow, I'd never know. I can't believe, I can't believe how, how this place looks. And, and that's what, it's, a lot of times people don't tell you that, they won't say that to you, but that's how we should intend to make them feel. Mm -hmm. Well, that, That's know, the point. I think the voice comparison is, is outstanding because it's so true. I mean, I think everyone right now, and, and even for, during probably the last four weeks, The Voice, they all can sing. I'm not talking about not being able to sing because they can sing. But the other things that they can do, sometimes they can sing but have no presence. Sometimes they can sing and have no confidence. Sometimes they can sing but they're sounding just like the, the artist who's, who uh, they're, they're copying. singing. They're they copying. Like karaoke song. Yeah, so therefore they don't have any uniqueness. Um, I can tell you when I'm sitting back and watching, and I can tell when I, when I move up in my seat and want to get closer to the screen, or when I want silence in the house so I can enjoy this singer, that's power attraction mm -hmm. right then. There's times when someone can be on stage singing and I, the conversation, it's not unpleasant because they can sing. Um, but conversation's still going on in the house, but when that person grabs you they grab your senses they grab your insides and you you've got to pay attention that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. and I'm watching these last people and one of these girls is 14 years old 14 and I think seriously but what those coaches were willing to do on the boys is to lean in and say how are we going to create power attraction for you with this audience and this girl's gonna go somewhere. I mean, maybe it's gonna take her 10 years, but the learning experience right now, they have that one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I can tell you, if you need someone to judge your business, give someone permission to be brutally honest and say, hey, were you drawn in right when you walked in? Uh, what are we missing here? Because we're so comfortable here doing what we do that we sometimes forget how we're perceived by the community. What do we look like? What do we sound like? And uh, what can um, we do better? Terry, I think that's that's a challenge too because we generally go to the person who's going to praise us because mm -hmm. we, we really want more of a cheerleader than an objective opinion. 
and, and sometimes if you if you go and you ask someone in your community and it's one of your best clients, one of your best guests, they go, oh, you're amazing. They, they love it. They've already made their, their choice and they'll give you wiggle room here and there and they're not going to say anything bad. So my suggestion would be find someone who... I would take an interior decorator and bring her in. Yeah, who, who shot or, or a window planner, a window, window planner, designer, yep. a store, uh, store, store shop, uh, branding person. Find that person or find someone who is a guest in a business that has that it factor for you. Where does your prototypical guest shop? What businesses do they frequent when they're not in your salon? Mm -hmm. What are their other choices? And then say, okay, let's bring that person in and have them give uh, a, a clear uh, kind of secret shopping impression of what your of what your business is. Sometimes, sometimes people go, well, I can't an interior designer for a salon. I mean, they just do homes. No, no, they have they have a great eye. They've learned it, and and if you don't, you know, you could even take someone from Nordstrom and say, hey, can you come in? I mean, I bet you know some clients that probably can make your business look better. Uh, and, and you know what, sometimes it's, it's just having a conversation with someone to find out what they know. Uh, we're in the process of putting someone uh, in, into our guest experience leader in Chicago. And this person had, um, display design experience with H&M, went store to store to store to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that person's view of our school in Chicago, from a guest experience standpoint, I'm not just talking about displays or, or signage, but the whole feel like guest, guest experience yeah. there. And, and that person was able to bring some really interesting, from their bag of tricks, some really interesting insights into what we do, how we do it, why we do it, maybe what's working, what isn't working. Those are the types of things you want. Oh, yeah. We don't necessarily want someone who's just going to come in and say, oh, you're wonderful, we love you, this is perfect. If it was perfect, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be on this either. Yes, okay. So now, visual by design. Mm -hmm. It's on purpose. So the design, oh, sorry, Brian, I'm playing. Um, Let's talk about move him back. So I'm playing with the camera. Okay. So design of salon technically. This is pretty much sometimes um, this is where it's the most focus because it's the most revenue generating square footage. However, it's uh, it looks technical. It doesn't look contagious. So when you look at the stations, the wash house, the color bar. Sometimes people will put a wash house in and they display things beautifully and they, they scent it and they've got extra product in there to create another uh, visual area of uh, desire. And then you go back a year later and there's nothing in there. It happens in our schools. Mm -hmm. You know, you can open up a school and it can look beautiful. And oh, I love when they have a wash house contest. That's my favorite when they're going to submit pictures for a wash house and it looks absolutely fabulous and then you visit it and it doesn't look anything like that. You know, staging a house is a lot different than living and experiencing a house. And sometimes I think we're staging, but we're not, we're not looking like that on a daily basis. So how could the stations look? How could we create that unified approach? Even a PSA, you're going to think this is really crazy, but I felt like when we first put our our cubicles in our corporate office that it looked like a bowling alley. It was just a long, dark hallway, and I thought, ooh, it's, it's too stiff. It doesn't look inviting. Um, it's not welcoming if people walk by. Uh, it doesn't look like someone's eager to talk to somebody else. So I, I put chairs all the way down. And as soon as I did that, it looked like I'm ready to meet with you. It, it just softened the whole area. Who touches the chairs more than anyone at PSC? Me. I walk down, make sure I'm just mine every day. Do you touch it? Okay. I walk down and I make sure it's on the same line of the carpet and I tilt them. And I'm always making sure, just like when you walk through your home, you're fixing a pillow, you're arranging. And sometimes I think that happens when we're in a grand open, but it doesn't have a daily commitment, a daily eye. So we're looking at the stations. How do they look? Do they angle up? Are they soft? Do the stations products look, look a mess? Are they hidden? Are they out? Do we have fresh flowers on occasion? 
what, what are we looking like at our stations? That's the whole point. What are we looking like at the wash house? And what are we looking like at the color bar? These are our technical areas that are used the most. But they can get dirty really fast. They can get cluttered very fast. And they're not inviting in all, in all cases. Sometimes stains uh, from color kind of ruin the effect of what we've got there. Then we have the design of the storefront. And I, and I call this the salon storefront because it really is supposed to represent just that. It is the waiting area, which many times the square footage is designated to extra chairs versus the ability to uh, romance the customer. Create little stations of take home, not a wall of take home, but a, a, a stations of take home. And let's say you want a whole month that we're, we're talking about volume. And how are we going to merchandise the volume area? What does it look? It's either to be or not to be. And in most cases, the design of the storefront, <coughs> I walk in and the area is dusty. It's not faced properly. Uh, there's not enough product to create. I mean, as soon as, uh, I didn't finish my thought, there's not enough product <coughs> to create excitement. So let's say you have a, a shelf. It happens here at PSC a lot, a big shelf and you're out of some products. Now we have to take the other products on the shelf and give it width to make that shelf not look empty, but make it look attractive. And you need to know, just moving a few things, are you leaving? Just the car. Okay. Would you go in my purse? I need three, uh, three et cetera, please. Um, it's in that little pouch at <laughs> So you go up to the shelf and, and let's say there's, let's say, I'm gonna use this, Brian, can I? Let's say there's, there's product there like this, okay? And they're all lined up. Now we've got these two products are gone. First thing you should do is now create width so that shelf doesn't look empty. And when those products come back in, these move back to the back. But you need to be able to see where the holes are in your storefront and how are you gonna to respond to those holes. So the design front also should could always have a storytelling place. Like, what are you working on? Right now, right when you walk into PSC, we're, we're focused on neuro. And uh, everything is about the neuro line, the, the tools that go with it, the product. And when you walk in, it, it's either um, conscious or unconsciously the guest is saying, that's what they're featuring today. How's that look in your salon? What are you featuring today? So we also have the design of facilitation. How's the concierge or the front desk look? How does our beverage service look? How does our, our coat area look? Or do we have hooks for them to do? How does our area facilitation, our gowns look, our changing area if you offer it? Uh, how do the power rooms look? I mean, these are all visual by design. And so when you walk in, you're judging all these different areas. I've got people even at PSC that will walk in and they don't do anything but walk in the building and go to their area. They don't walk in with a purpose inspecting while they go. And then of course you have the details. What do we look like when we open? What do we look like during the business hours? What do we look like during the close? And what's our resting position when something's not being used? And these are all done with a purpose. These are great staff meetings. These are great systems to put in place I mean, if I'm giving you the chairs example of our, our corridor going back into our corporate cubicles, but that's an example of how it's done by design. So when your color bar is not used, do you drape the chairs differently for the color area? Do you angle them all a certain way? Are the, uh, does the color bar itself have a certain way it's looked? The developers are always in the right spot. This is all done by design so the guests can be brought in and want to enjoy all of it. So these are your, your different areas. Um, I just think that, again, uh, John Paul says all the time that successful people do all the things that unsuccessful people aren't willing to do. And, and I think what we're talking about here is degrees of success. And, and I really think that these are all things that a business would do if you were just open. Well, I think of Catherine, who's just opened oh, yeah. Bella, Look at what's and Bella, and all the thought that went into every single thing. I mean, she can tell Sleepless you why she, yeah. Yeah, why she put that chandelier here, and why the 
shelving looks like this there. And, and why did I station. put that tile at the barber shop? And why did I use the name Bella and Bello? Right. And and so what what you really get down to is is that are those things we do Just only on open. startup? Are those things that should have seasonal review? And and I know, and even our 11 year old son this morning while we were waiting for the bus, he said, Dad, we just, and this 11 year old, think about, I wasn't thinking about this at 11. He said, think about the fact that we just celebrated New Year's Day, January 1st, and the year's almost half over, over. And I thought, oh my God. The first thing I thought was, you're talking like a little old man. Second thing I thought was, is time really moving fast now for people at that age? Because time was slow when I was that age. Grade school seemed like it would never end. And, and the school year seemed like it would never end. And here they're down One to the month last never week. ended. They'd say, okay, yeah. write March on your table. Oh, okay. You couldn't so, even believe it. So my point is here is that seasons can pass quickly. And if we haven't looked at or touched up or changed or had a new statement, uh, from, from a technical standpoint, from a display standpoint, from an image standpoint, from a what we're focused on now standpoint, if you're not setting reminders in your calendar, I guarantee we're missing opportunity. Guarantee we're missing opportunity. Well, I'm, I'm writing a message that I want to say to Jamie just based on what Steve just said. You know, it's funny, when I gave you the example of the chairs in the, in the corridor, he would never see that. He would never see a chair that's not lined up right. That's just not you. Depends on where I am. I see it at the school. Oh, okay. So, but you've got to find the people that are going to see that and respond to it so it protects who you are. Um, th this is really, when you look at your visual identity, um, my staff is always like, well, just hang that up. What's the big deal? Because it's not attractive. It doesn't complement everything else is there. There's some people that'll put a charge key up and go, okay, that's good. No, it really doesn't complement the way you've got that in place. So you've got a position that attracts. Even the way people lay out their magazines drives me nuts because they'll just they'll lay them out. But the magazine has, has more, um, more, how do I want to say, uh, star power than your menu or your offerings. Magazines get more square footage than than our offerings in the salon. Well, and, and at the same time, salon magazines are notorious for being out of date. Oh, terrible. And they're, they're notorious for being- Yeah, that's current, right? Yeah, picked through. yeah and, and, and again, how do they expect current looks if what's out there is not current? So your presence, what is your presence like? Um, I had a young lady I was, I was coaching just re recently, and Gosh, she's the nicest girl, but she has no confidence in her presence. Your visual identity is not just things, it's also your people. Do your people compliment? Sometimes even when we get a little casual, like I hate the word casual Friday, but sometimes we can get so casual we look sloppy. What is your presence of your staff like? I go to a, a salon to get my, uh, my eyebrows done, and I've talked about uh, skin girls Many times it's right next to where Jack receives occupational therapy. But they have themes for their staff too, mm -hmm. on their image. Every Wednesday is Red Lips Day and they slick back their hair. And, and they've got themes with their staff like they have themes with their business. And I, and I really think that creates a, a different presence for them. If it didn't, I wouldn't be talking about it, mm -hmm. right? So it, it obviously does. And the visual identity that everything has a place and everything serves a purpose. And you can tell when things are out of place. Everything's thought about to enhance who we are to our guests. Well, and I'll tell you also, even from a design standpoint, when we put, on design, we put a, a barbering area into our Lombard school location. And <clears throat> because that's, Part of my background that's in my bag of tricks i was very uh, comfortable in designing the cabinetry that went along with that but i messed up and until we actually started teaching barbers i didn't realize how i messed up and that's the cabinetry is really good but it's set up for uh left-handed 
barbers, not right-handed barbers. The majority of them are right-handed. And so that, you know, again, a simple little thing, but it's, it's a detail. And, and it's one that I missed in an area that I was trying to be really, really right on with. And so you wind up with, what do we do about that? And, and I'm sure that you all bumped into things like that in your business. And do we just continue to have them be out of place? Or do we, or do we work on them? Do we find a way? And, and that's, that, you know, that's something that we're working on. But um, had no idea. That's where we have to listen to the people that are using it. Once you, once you, you might have put something in place, I, I guess is what I'm saying, and, and, and it might not be practical. Well, the front desk is a great example of that. Until you are a volume center, you know, you might have started the business with one computer. Now you need two people up there. Well, do you need another computer? Probably. Where are you going to put it? There's no room. Where are they going to stand? Are they going to bump into each other? I couldn't bump into each other all day. That's not in my wheelhouse at all. I'd kill some if I had to bump into them all day. I've got to have space. I've got to have end. I've got to be able to breathe. And so I, I couldn't do that. So I think about this in the restaurant industry. When we would open a restaurant, where are we putting the hostess podiums? Where are we putting the menus? If we have 10 people coming through here at the same time to be seated, we actually all 10 of us get in a circle and say, okay, where are we standing when 10 people are right here? Where do the menus need to go? Do they need to hang? Do they need to place? Where are we gonna put those? What's the checkout area? So we literally would create uh, groups of people because when a restaurant's busy, you make decisions when a restaurant's empty. We didn't make decisions when the restaurant's busy. And so we would have to create our own version of busy and do like a mock example of that. And what's it, what's it like to do that? And usually frustration doesn't happen when you're closed. Frustration, frustration in business happens while the business is in full gear. So walking the salon tells the story of who you are, not just when you're closed, not when you're just given a tour, but when you're operating capacity or sometimes beyond. And that's what's really something. Everything has a place. Why do you put that there? One of the greatest little areas here at PSC, because we came in and followed a 70 year business and we gutted most of it, but there was one area I love, and that's the paper supply area. I don't know what they used it for, but I love it. At one time, PSC had five or six paper supply areas. And when we got here, we went down to one. And it had this, this, these nooks and crannies to be able to hold everything we have in one area. It improved our efficiencies with uh, paper goods, but also our efficiencies of waste. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really amazing. And that area, there's no way I was going to uh, demo that because it complemented and served a purpose for us in a huge way. And, and everyone likes it. I love talking about it. I, even when I give a tour, I love this area. People look at me like, what? Why is this a big deal? And when I explain to them how it, it increased our efficiencies and how we look at a glance and, and that we expect to look like that when we open coverage. We don't expect anything to fall out on us. How many times we walk in places and they order it again because they can't find it? Right. Well, and yeah. And, and so what are the non-typical things in a salon? Where do you store it? How do you store it? How do you maintain that identity for the things that you want out of sight that are only viewed sometimes? And, and it can be a, a station drawer. It can be, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it can be a mirror. It, it's funny, we, we put a uh, consultation guide on the mirrors in the school. And there was one mirror that didn't have a consultation guide on it. Why? And and a guest noticed that it his match. his yeah. stylist always chooses that station because that consultation guide isn't there. And I thought that was so interesting because the things that the things that maybe was that, was that you know, in their way in their view. And what, it's not in their way, but but it is when you look. I mean, it's it's positioned so it would be maybe here on the mirror. I would want it there. Either. Interesting. I, I wouldn't want it. I wanted. To I'd want that guest to be the focus in my mirror, not a, not a mirror clean. Yeah, that's interesting. So how do we walk the business and really critique it and don't make excuses for it, be able to defend it? Mm -hmm. It's not an excuse. It's either we have this here for this reason. Well, 
how does it look? And I can tell you, um, the greatest way for you to critique that if you're too close to your own business at first is going into a restaurant and see where those waitresses use their service area on the restaurant floor, where they keep their coffee, where they keep their coffee cups, where they keep their busboy things, where they keep their extra napkins and linens and, and uh, uh, utensils. What does that area look like? And usually it's not attractive. I, mean, I cannot have dinner. If Steve doesn't know this about me, he might already. If we're seated in a restaurant, I can never look at the kitchen because I wouldn't eat. And if I ever am in a restaurant, I don't want to look at the service and the service alley either, ever. I've got to be able to look out because it, it's um, it's not aesthetically pleasing to me right. at all. And a lot of businesses. And when, I can remember when, uh, when I was with Steak and Ale, because theirs was like an old pub, uh, they brought antique reproduction furniture in. And that's what we used for our, our service alleys. They weren't an eyesore. They, they looked better. And they had covered drawers. And, uh, and they had to be replaced on a regular basis because of usage. but they didn't look bad. And a busboy was never to store a bus uh, tub out in the dining room. It always had to be carried in and carried out. They were never left. And I'm giving you that example because that was our system on purpose. Mm -hmm. Not a system by act. Would it have been more convenient to always have a bus tub on the floor? Sure. It would have been really easy for a waitress to pick up one and throw it on there. But we use tray service, not tub service. And that's a big difference, right? And what are your service ways that you do things? The visual target. This is kind of what you were talking about before. Do you want to re reemphasize this? Again, I, I just I think it's consistency and it's on purpose and it's intentional. Um, the way your logo is presented, the way your team looks, um, the color choices, the palette that you use, the fonts that you use in your communication. We're constantly, uh, you know, and, 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 and almost sometimes it's, it's irritating uh, to chase after the same thing over and over again. But you get sick of hearing me talk about fonts. But nonetheless, that's our font. yeah, we, we have a company font. And, and it better be used. And, and so do the manufacturers that we represent. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just a matter of using the fonts that are in place because it does make a difference in the way and the consistency of the way you present your brand. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, the, the real key, even, even in the examples that I gave earlier on Starbucks, they wouldn't think of using a different font or a different <laughs> display Just for, the cuter word, today. for the word blonde, right? If it's, if it's blonde on the app, the way they write it, if it's blonde on the doorway, on the, on the uh, visual decal that they have on the doorway, if it's blonde on the signage by the drive through it's all the same. Well, I don't, I don't write a memo to our staff. <laughs> to our staff without using our company font. I don't do, um, I have a hard time even sometimes because of our email, you know, I always say, what's the closest, if these are my my uh, options here, what's the closest to, to our font? It, it needs to look like us all the time, not a version of us to look like us. And that's a big deal. And even social media. You know, when you look at your, your imagery and your accents and let's say you have something printed um, at the, the printer, you're going to do a whole philanthropic. It still needs to be in your font. And you can use other things. You can bold it or whatever and have a couple options, but you don't want people that just, because they'll, they'll start putting hearts on for dotted eyes and, you know, they'll just make up their own version and all of a sudden you, you just look a mess again. Right? Okay. The extras. Um, can these things make a difference in your business? Whether you have flowers, you offer candy at the end. I'll give an example. We were in a rest, uh, hotel called Zaza. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And in Houston, and then one of the things they had out for all their guests was a, a big jar of uh, hot tamales. Loved the, it. The candy hot tamales. Yeah, wonderful. And I, and I incorporated it here. But until I say reorder the hot tamales, don't let it get down to one in there. You got to protect it. I also want a candy bar outside this door. Just little things so customers can have a, you know, leave a sweet. It's touching the senses. And, we, and of course, there'll be M&Ms in there because that's our signature in every box that we have. But I want a little candy, candy area 
for the customer and do enjoy. And I can tell you, if I don't stay on it, it'll go away. If I don't stay on it, it'll never get done. And because it's not a have to, it's a nice to. However, that nice to is gonna create another moment for our customers, right? So you look at towels, how do your towels and capes look? Even at the schools, how often do you have to say, throw those away? Yeah, until, we, until that, we as leaders, as owners, say throw it away. Throw it away, they'll keep it. I mean, this pen could be broken in half and someone would still try to write, but you have to say, get rid of that. That's not who we are. Code service, is there a system for it or is it sloppy? Your wrap service, what does it look like to close a sale with you? And I heard this, uh, I heard this that uh, I was interviewing a girl yesterday and she said, in our salon, we ask, do you want a bag? And I thought, really? Well, yeah, because you know, if they just put it in their purse, it helps the environment. I said, then you have to say that. You cannot say, do you want a bag without explanation? Because do you want a bag sounds lazy. You want a bag? I'll throw it in my purse. Yeah, okay, bye. Versus, would you like to help us with our uh, our commitment to being green in the salon. Do you need a bag to, you know, say something, but you can't just say if you want a bag. That was right. the class we were teaching. Right. I mean, it, that's the difference in being intentional or looking sloppy. Or doing the minimum, yeah. Yeah. I mean, intentional is we have a commitment to the environment. And because of that, we make a point to offer you as our guest either a bag or you can uh, carry, it, carry it out in your purse or any way you'd like. We found that to help by reducing waste. That is intentional. That's intentional. That sounds so much better than how I said it. And it, yeah, it's intentional and it makes a difference. And people are going to rally behind an intentional statement. But they're, you want a bag? I mean, I, I would go out shaking my head. I really would. All right, so let's talk about the wow factor. When you look at the wow factor, these are the six things we're thinking about. You've got to be an innovator. You've got to always be seeking out what is next and take risks to discover. Um, whether we were at Zaza witnessing something there, when we were at a, a place in Toronto, a, a counter distributor who had something, I said, and I've got to bring that, bring that home. I couldn't wait to tell Steve about it. Not, oh, that's nice, you've got it, versus how can we incorporate where we are? You have to be always analyzing what could be done. I mean, I, I'm irritated every time I go to Chili's. I don't know why, but I am. That they can close out the sale that easily at Chili's, yet it still takes us too long to check out a guest here. It makes me a crazy person. Yeah, we don't have their budget. I understand that. But I want to make the way our guests shop at our place to be easy and, and smooth as silk at um, technology technology wise. Pleasing. Technologically pleasing. Thank you. Technolo techno okay. Technologically. Technologically. We'll handle that for you. Thank you. But I want it to be pleasing, not difficult. And even our staff says, you know, we're still too hard in this area. What are we going to need to do to get better? And maybe there's one little thing that'll just speed it up, just, just a little bit of a shift. When you think about being best in class, it's got to be the, your product services and or your guest experience. I love the salons that, that have an opening ritual. I have the salons that have a, a wash house experience that they're committed to, you no know, ifs, ands, and buts. I love the salons that have a, a scheduling team that is admired by the rest of the company versus bullied at the front desk. I, I just think when you're best in class, it's every square footage, you're best. You guide a guest through easily, you run on time, you're, you know, you look at, Something I've said this before, but airlines have to report their on time deliveries or uh, on time, land, what is it, on time arrivals. arrivals and percentages. Can you imagine if salons had to do that? What percentage of the time do we start on time? Or doctor's offices? What, what percentage do they arrive on time? It might be something that you use as a differential factor, maybe something you've mastered. Make sure you tell everyone you're best in class in that area. Uh, you dazzle the senses, creating a strong sensory package. How are we, how, what's our sight? What do we look like to our guest? 
What's the sound like? Sometimes we're still having music wars. How do we smell? I eat from Habitat just called me, she said, and I have that company. I want to create a scent just for Habitat, even nationally. Um, what's it like? What's our chairside manner? And how do we touch? And how do we move a guest through? And what kind of taste do we leave in their mouth? Maybe providing a mint, but the taste is what sits with us and what their impression of our business is. Uh, proof is everywhere. You, you want, and, and please don't get stuck behind, uh, we read our Yelps. You could do surveys, uh, you could be asking people, get statements of authority from uh, people that can give you, even if PSC is impressed by your business, get a, get a testimonial from PSC as a, a distributor or Steve and I. If we've complimented your business, ask for that in writing and then start using that in social media. If you've got customers that have been loyal for 20 years and ask them the reasons they, they have been that long, um, get them to give you statements. It's statements of authority, statements of history. You know, if Southwest were smart, they would call us right now because we could do a great commercial for Southwest. We're impressed with their organization. Starbucks, Nordstrom, no one's asking us. But are there people out there that could give you great, great testimonials for every part of your business, whether it be in a newsletter, whether it be in the social media, whether it be a handout on a daily basis, the back of a, a business card? You could do these in, in many different ways. You've got to impress your guests by being the expert, not just, with, not just with knowing what you do, but you've got to be the expert on how to say it, your preparation, your rehearsals. Uh, having that knowledge and expertise is critical. You still have people that sound terrible. Let me give you one that's driving me nuts right now. Besides the it's like and the um and saying is, but everyone repeats what you say. Everyone to almost it's embarrassing. Drive through a McDonald's with a 13 year old and 11 year old. And this, it goes something like this. Can I help you please? Yes, we'd like a 10 piece chicken nugget. You want a 10 piece chicken nugget? Yes. Any, anything else? Yes, I need extra honey mustard sauce with that, please. Extra honey mustard? Yes. I'd, I'd like a large fry with that. A large fry? Now you're getting the point. And it is, it's being done everywhere versus just acknowledging with yes, I've got that, or I'll be repeating it back to you at the end to confirm accuracy. It sounds terrible. By the time I'm done it, just ordering McDonald's, and that was just Jack's meal, I'm irritated. And it's taking, how much time does that take for every single thing to be repeated? And they don't say, it could be said something like this, 10 piece chicken nugget, please, 10 piece chicken nugget, large root beer, large root beer. They could say it like that. We do repeating here because of, people getting sometimes their products confused. But to say it like a question every time, like you didn't hear it, that's what's irritating. I'd like a 10 piece chicken nugget. You want a 10 piece chicken nugget? <sighs> Instead of just confirming what's listed. Are you guys hearing that or is it just me? It's everywhere. You don't, you don't notice it? It depends on where I go. Do you notice it? I, I notice it. You notice it more when I'm there. Well, I, you know what, I think that I'll put up with it in a drive-thru because I want it right. But no one does drive-thru like Starbucks does. Starbucks does it right. Um, <clears throat> I learned because the kids eat at McDonald's <clears throat> excuse me, more than we'd like. I know the idiosyncrasies of the, of the various McDonald's around town. <laughs> there's, there's one McDonald's that I go through that in lane one, on the screen, it shows what the people in lane two are ordering. And they haven't figured it out or corrected it now in over a month. So I think that's, that's so interesting that, it wouldn't, that they wouldn't figure that out. There's another one where... Well, they're not inspecting, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, so it's... But it's crazy. See, we all have experiences like that. I'm sure that, that there's many of you out there that have experiences with companies that, that we, we will tolerate. We will tolerate less than eye candy. We will tolerate less than the wow factor well, until we find someone who does it better. That does it better consistently. So let me tell you this this story. And and I'm I'm 
I'm irritated at, at this because I couldn't believe this happened. So Steve and I were coming back from a, a funeral. We were driving the back way to the office. Come down this big hill and I see a white van, a large white van trying to lure a 10 or 11 or 12 year old girl. And it, did, it didn't sit well with me. And all I could think of is if I, if I saw it and I didn't do anything and something happened, I'd never forgive myself. So I drove down, Steve told me where the police station is in Rockdale and I ran over. And first of all, you have to ring the bell. And she goes, yeah, I'm irritated already, not how can I help you? And I said, yes, ma'am, this is an emergency or it could be, this is what I just witnessed. We're at right up, right 200 yards from here. She goes, that's not Rockdale, that's Joliet. And I said, I don't care where it's at. This girl could be in trouble. And I, I yelled at her and she didn't help me. She goes, well, that's Joliet, we can't do anything. I said, great. So then I came out and the police officer just happened to be coming back to the office. I pulled him over. He goes, that's Joliet. I said, really, is that what you're gonna say to me too? Because that's what she said. Because I'll go check it out. I said, good decision. And, and I was so angry, but was she right? Was she right that that's out of their jurisdiction? Yes. Did she say it the wrong way? Yes. She said it the wrong way. They can't inform another police department that this is what was just said and we're going to check it out. And I mean, come on. That's when our staff says, oh, we don't have that product. Or she's busy, she's booked out for six weeks. Are they saying the right thing? Yes. Are they saying it the wrong way? Yes. Their preparation, their knowledge, their expertise, and their professionalism is all questioned. And you think about your deliverables, whether they're on time or not, with the quality of the work. You want to exceed the expectations of that customer. And systemize customer services processes for consistency. You systemize. I love this. Let systems run the business and let people run the systems, right? The only way to add wow factor to a salon is to incorporate it into a system, component, or procedure. They're not done by accident. They're always done with high intentions. If we're gonna create a wow factor or we're gonna create power attraction or or we're going to create these things that are going to make a difference, we have to be purposeful. First of all, we have to say, where, where can we improve? Where are enhancements needed here? Where do we look sloppy? I mean, in our company, we say the word sloppy to each other a lot. We look sloppy right now. We're better than that. And it might be great to someone else. You know what? We've set a new standard for ourselves. That sloppiness isn't okay for us. We need to incorporate the system or procedure. And it's not okay for two people to know. It's okay only when the whole company is honoring it and moving and it's helping us be more efficient. You know, I think about, we went a lot of different directions, but Icon, eye candy is only created with great systems in place. And It's only created consistently. Well, yeah. I, I, you know, even, even to see the, the candy jar empty out in the hallway right now, you, you look at it and say, obviously I didn't put enough fuss into that. And I didn't say, I want this done and I didn't put a deadline on it because when you don't give deadlines, no one takes it seriously. Or this is the way I want this to look now. We would never think of doing a class without cookies. Why did I think it? Why did anyone in the company think that after I gave a, a intention of candy in a jar that it was okay for it to be loved? Right? That's something I did. So I've got I've got to fix that. Why did you do that? Why did I let it get low? I, I obviously didn't say reorder. Candy. I mean, how bad does an empty candy jar look? You think it's all stuck down there? And yes, that's true. <laughs> so, what do you? What else are you thinking? I mean, what's the, what do I say every time you come home from school? I love it. And what else do I say? How do we look? How do we look? Always. How do we look? And I say it to keep it front of mind. Because if it's not, it'll get away from us very quickly. So again, what I'd encourage you to do is, is, is maybe sit down and make a schedule for review. Yeah. 
I like the season review because three months does go by really fast. And then your visual review, maybe you can get 60 days out of one visual. I wrote to Jamie, how long's Neuro been up? I mean, has it been up too long? And do I need to get her on a calendar? And, and now I'm gonna spark her. One of the things we did at the schools is the first Tuesday of every month, right? Starts class. And, and I love that because you don't have to say, when are we starting a class? It's always the first Tuesday. It keeps everyone focused on, if you had to say, what's the date we're starting? The 18th uh, or 24th, so next month it's the 10th. Too hard. And I like to put things in place, um, even visually. You know, the first of every month, we're gonna change our, our visual. The first business day of every month, we're gonna change our visual. That helps, that helps people stay motivated and committed and knowing what's next. Good, we're done. Thank you, Brian. Is there anything miss? We're good? Thank you all so much. We'll see you next month. Have a great one. Bye. Bye.